Hello everyone, today we talk briefly about the Gits or Gaiets or Yats or Yats or Yatas or Gats or Jets. There are different ways um, pronouncing uh, the name of uh, this uh, North Germanic people inhabiting the today's southern Swedish land, or oh, in fact, Gotland, right? Um, a people essentially existing as such uh, from antiquity to uh, the late Middle Ages, as we will see now the, the thing depends on which uh, standards you you apply here. There is going to be a lot of mispronunciations um, here, because again, aside from the various debates on the of how actually some languages were, were spoken and sounded at the time, but also different uh, at, at times even different spellings depending on the sources, but also different uh, ways that in the modern language were, were used um, to, to call what we'll call again the Geats, mostly um, uh, Geetish uh, as an adjective. Um, and this people is quite fascinating for a number of reasons. First of all, um, I made a video about medieval Sweden and we've seen this pretty tormented history. Due to the characteristics uh, of the country in terms of size, the largest uh, in Scandinavia and thus more difficult, let's say, to uh, politically unite compared to uh, to the Jutland Peninsula and even some parts at least of today's southern Sweden that, as you know, like Scania were under uh, the, Dan uh, the Danes, the, the Danish uh, at some point. Also the Norway that fundamentally developed in some, aside from the bigger size of the country in some specific, you know, locations uh, along the coast. Um, and that was also less exposed to um, Western influxes, right? And that, uh, for this reason, again, would uh, take longer to, to compact and to leave us also um, some specific information, at least the necessary ones for reconstructing adequately the history uh, of these peoples. And also because of the, uh, I would say, the, the Geats being important for this connection with the gods, that is, it's not much equivocal in itself, but one must understand who was who exactly, who, who was part of whom, uh, and what kind of connections existed between these peoples uh, and the ones that eventually, um, uh, you know, went on. In, in history with the names of gods as the, the largest polities uh, essentially emerging from the, from the migration era, right? So the Geats are one of the progenitor groups of probably the modern Swedes, along with, in fact, the Swedes, uh, the tribe that eventually gave the name to the larger country, which included the Geats and the Gudes um, uh, inhabiting this one, the island of uh, Gotland. Um, and the, the name of the Geats survived, as we were saying before, in the, uh, uh, the, the modern Swedish provinces of Vester Gotland and Öster Gotland. Um, so, as you understand from the name, that the western and eastern uh, halves of the lands of the Geats. Right, and as well as in many other toponyms telling the truth, and not just in uh, today's Sweden, not just in, in Scandinavia, but also abroad. Right, there is even properly a Swedish dialect known as Götamol, which constitutes the at least loose uh, linguistic legacy of uh, the uh, tongues spoken by by the Geats. Um, so the etymology of Geet uh, is the Proto-Germanic Gautats um, that is definitely the the same of gods and gudes. All right, uh, the names uh, are all connected to the same uh, root uh, Geutana, that is too poor, right? Which uh, means both, let's say, pouring their seed as much as sacrificing, um, and therefore expressing, and as we'll see now, this, this idea is recovered perhaps also by Jordanus and other late antique authors regarding 
Scandinavia as, as this vagina of peoples, right? The idea that Scandinavia had been pouring out this uh, these stocks that had uh, at some point uh, essentially compacted in in the continent and opened the way further further south. Right? Today we do not talk specifically about that. But it's important to remember because in spite of the, let's say, relative, um, um, say, homogeneity of, of the Germanic peoples, in, in many ways at this point, Scandinavia and the continent were substantially different. Right? It had been since the time, of course, of the Indo-European uh, migrations. As somebody said, uh, oh, maybe the, this etymology is connected to the fact that the land inhabited by the uh, Geats had uh, rivers. Um, these people were but but uh, it's uh, normally dismissed. Doesn't it would be just a coincidence geographically about a name that instead was more likely very, very spiritual, in uh, and symbolical and meaningful. Uh, in its origins, right? Uh, as we will see, Jordanus will speak specifically of the Gauti gods, um, that is to say, the ones, um, at least this is one of the theories, living near the river Gaut. So there would be a connection, perhaps, with today's Goethe Helf, right? Which is a river that drains uh, um, Lake Ferner. Uh, into the Kattegat, uh, specifically at the city of Gothenburg, that, as we will see, was called like that. It was just actually founded in the 17th century, but called after the uh, Geats. Um, the Old Norse for the Goethe Helf would be uh, Gauthelfer. Um, and uh, others have believed differently as much as the fact that Gauti may have been a sort of gloss next to the word gods in the in the, in the accounts so the Gauti gods would have emerged um, as just randomly right um, uh, we uh, have um, uh, also a connection perhaps with a, with a fall uh, the troll had done uh, one in the Goethe River in Sweden that may have been connected with the sense of pouring again, but they're just random theories. But we have no, no evidence of them, and I don't think it's necessarily uh, the case um, uh, in the first place. Uh, in the Old Norse, the Gauthi gods would have been the Gauthar, right? So normally considered just the inhabitants of Vesta Gotland. So the west part of, uh, of the Gitish, uh land, right? And in the Icelandic sagas, we find uh, still th this meaning. As we will see, um, these sources would bear a greater memory of these people than the um, the, the western ones, uh, for the reasons we'll explain now. Now, the first time the Geats are named um, is in the work of Ptolemy, so in the 2nd century AD, who refers to uh, them in Greek as Gutai. In the 6th century, with the reactivation of uh, ethnographic in uh, interest because of the migration era and the fact that some of you know, the authors were connected, of course, uh, with uh, these populations ancestrally, in fact, uh, Jordanus uh, that was a Roman bureaucrat, but widely believed, at least to to, to be of Gothic descent, writes of the Gauti gods and the Ostrogoths, that is to say, the um, the, the the gods inhabiting uh, Scania fundamentally. Then Procopius, uh, uh, right around the same time, refers to the Gautoi as well. The North Saga's name, as we've seen, this people is Gautar, right? In Beowulf and Witzit, we have we know them as um, Gietas, or again, this uh, Yats or Yatas, uh, depending on how you wanna, um, you know, the direct again phonological theories about how the thing would have properly meant or sounded uh, at the time. Um, in Beowulf, as you know, the, the hero comes fundamentally from. Uh, from the Geats, um, there are several 
names of Gittish kings. Uh, only Igelak finds, however, a confirmation historically through the Liber Monstrorum, in which he is described as Rex Getarum, and in a copy at least of the Historia Francorum, which he is called Rege Gotorum. Um, so the idea is that he would have been at least either king of a broader Gittish, uh, let's say, realm, or at least one of the, as we will see now, petty kings of of the Gites or the Goths, depending on how we want to consider them now. Um, this sources specifically talk of Higelac because of the raid into Frisia around 516 AD, um, described also in Beowulf, right? And uh, Jordanus that lived uh, around the same, say, you know, writing in the mid 6th century, described the Geats as definitely a bold nation uh, that was quick to engage in war and so fitting fundamentally the pattern that we have seen here and there uh, about uh, also during the Anglo Saxon conquest of Britain, etc., these um, North Germanic, Norse peoples that were, of course, migrating, right, uh, also as, as a consequence of internal struggle, of exiles, of desire for loot, uh, etc., and that were, uh, let's say, evaluated on the basis of their um, invasive capacities, let's put it in this way. Um, in fact, the Anglo-Saxon settlement of Britain bears trace of Scandinavian influence. Famously enough, I, I talked about uh, Kent, East Anglia, etc. There was a time in which we thought that even the Sutton who burial was connected with some Swedish um, uh, craftsmanship and, and this kind of things. But their presence is there. Uh, it's across a consistent amount of, naturally, the, especially the eastern uh, British coast, uh, from from north to south, really, especially alongside strategically important Roman roads, right? Uh, they group together with other scattered war bands. There may have been some Germanic elements coming, even from the Visigoths, right, which is somehow overlooked. Right, yes, there were Visigothic bands that at some point moved from Gaul and even from more far away to Britain at some point. We think that mostly the Geats m mixed uh, together with the Utish elements, as we will see at the end. There are some fringe theories saying that the, the Utes themselves may have been uh, connected with the Geats in, in some way, or even Geatish. Uh, but it's it's not demonstrable uh, as well. Um, the um, the Jews, uh at some point, uh, as you know, they were with Hengist and Horsa, uh, the the first to to settle because those war bands were still um, a Romano-Britonic government existed and had been calling them, uh, and uh, the Geats were witnesses of, of such uh, events and prompted other groups to move in in spite of the early also defeats that occurred at the hands of the Romano Britons of these uh, early groups. Uh, we know some of them uh, moved to Yorkshire where they seemingly founded Gillingshire by the Tees River uh, uh, and uh, originally known in fact as uh, Gitling uh, upper. It has also been suggested that uh, the East Anglians took with them lots of Geats during their settlement in in Britain, and that uh, the Wolfings, so the powerful clan in, in Beowulf, um, uh, also would have come from Gotland, right, and bringing. By the way, the beautiful Beowulf epos with them in the pro in the process with the great fortune that it, it would have also in in England. Uh, so this first phase is basically until 
the mid 6th century, right? After that, um, you, Western Europe was really, say, Europe as a whole was exhausted at large. Uh, the continent had been struck by Justinian's plague. Uh, the greater movements had been, as we've seen, quite desperate um, uh, things most of the times. Um, many of uh, the, the people that moved from Scandinavia were at the time even just outcasts from the motherland and they had left simply because they there weren't enough resources there so when these movements basically end also triggered again by the political opportunities as we've seen abroad etc we witness starting from the mid uh, 6th century to a phase of you know uh, exhaustion of coldening of um of, of stabilization, right? Because those uh, energies had been spent, right? And this is common to basically all uh, all of Europe uh, at this point. And in the north, where resources were even scarcer than practically anywhere else, except perhaps for Eastern Europe, um, this uh, settlement brought to a substantial stop of this main people's movements from Scandinavia to Britain, right? You have to await for the Viking era for having this um, this flows restarting consistently. Naturally, context existed, but there wasn't much of a greater need of, um, let's say, of, of keeping them more lively, right? Uh, all these societies were naturally of kind of agricultural based and again with uh, a dramatically poor surplus so there wasn't much that could be done even just in terms of exchange we'll make videos about um, trade in the North Sea in the Baltic etc yes it existed but it was not so intense uh, and especially Scandinavia was a bit you know cut out of the major other major regions especially the western ones uh, at that point, mostly um, at that point, settling uh, internal matters. So, how would this this Geats be organized, even just politically? At this from this point onwards, we know a very very few. Right, Procopius says that there were thirteen quote very numerous nations. On the Scandinavian peninsula, in his times, right, uh, and this is let's say pretty vague, but consistent with what we think may have been a um, say a broader political organization of the region. Essentially, thirteen petty kingdoms of some sort, uh, naturally quite modest in in potential, uh, as we will see. Uh, some people had properly been leaving uh, these lands from quite a while because uh, they could support really a, 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 a contained amount of, of, of population. That's the reason why so many uh, Germanic people boasted some kind of Scandinavian origin because, as you know, they didn't quite come from there. Scandinavia had been conquered by the Proto-Germans by... Uh, Say uh, from the from from the continent, right? So also Vodanism, for example, had been developed uh, in the more militarily active um, Central Europe, etc. So what happened is that whenever there was a generation that could not be sustained for whichever political or environmental reason, these guys went out. And Scandinavia was actually less militarized, in fact, than than the South. But the, the Central Europe was much more about the concept the say of imperial domination right botanism being part of that the scandinavians had often even very much more tonic um deities at the same connected to 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 the earth the fertility compared to the more apollonian warlike germans of, of the continent but when as we will see hopefully at some point even with the origins of other peoples the longbirds etc they these peoples would convert to botanism they would at least to on a, a different kind of political and social profile, more compatible, if anything, with, with the needs of survival, because uh, you know, it was a pretty ruthless uh, reality. In any case, uh, consider that Scandinavia, at the end of the migration era, had gone significantly depopulated. 
and we see that there are some points, some villages archaeologically that disappear around uh, the migration era um, en masse, right? In ways that are, even if they had been connected with uh, with warfare, or other destructions, are consistent with probably the people going away completely from from there. Um, so each one of these um, nations, let's say, that uh, Procopius talks about corresponded fundamentally to sort of tribes, right? Uh, the ones listed by uh, Jordanus, right? By the 14th century, and really in Swedish history up to the high, late Middle Ages, we see a very few, right? We know that, um, this is broadly speaking about Scandinavia, of course, that there was by then a uh, a kingdom of Sweden, one of Norway um, in the west uh, and uh, that therefore whichever political um, uh, say independence we can think th these peoples or originally had had now uh, it had significantly been, been lost, the Geats as we'll see being um, taken over by the Swedes, right, but still remaining by that point uh, one of the largest groups, uh, you know, the, the recognizably so, uh, in in Sweden, as naturally a composite uh, country uh, over a quite uh, long amount of time, and struggle, right? It, we are often not even entirely documented about. So, Procopius and Jordanus, as we've seen, both mentioned the Geats, right? However, after them, the foreign sources about Scandinavia are really scarce, right? Uh, the early Middle Ages witnessed this contraction. Uh, after that, until the Viking era, fundamentally, there aren't other many great movements uh, of, at that point, not even properly of peoples, right? Aside from the Magyars that settled in Central Europe, it was mostly about the raids launched from certain specific places, and they didn't move as entire chunks like, like before, or at least they would be contained by, at that point, also Northern Europe, uh, Central Europe, kind of stronger polities that had been existing during the migration era, uh, since the Germanic peoples had taken over. Um, so we literally do not have much of an idea of what happened to the Geese at that point. Um, in the 9th century, we start having because of all the, the aforementioned Viking reasons, the Anglo-Saxons and the Franks talking a bit about Scandinavia in general. Um, and interestingly enough, the Geats are not named, right? So some scholars believe that this occurred because they had fundamentally already lost uh, their independence and therefore not counting as a, you know, uh, in fact, uh, protagonistic people in this regard. As we will see, things are more complex um, because the mm, Norwegian and Icelandic sagas of the 10th century actually talk uh, about the uh, the Geats, right? And not only they say they were independent, and at a point even clashing with the Norwegian kings that were, as you understand, ne next door in, in, the, in the west, in the northwest. Um, and the reason why the Anglo-Saxons and the Franks wouldn't see the Geats in, under that light is, first of all, of course, that the, the Norse were more familiar with Scandinavian issues uh, in general from, from the same place. Um, but also the fact that the Geats by that point may have not had much of a maritime um, connection, right? The, the Norwegians mostly doing that from, and, and but also the, the Danes from those coastlands that uh, would have opened to, to the Geatish uh, interland, right? Um, and this is generally speaking consistent, yes, with the idea of, of a bit of a more northern say, still southern Scandinavia, but in, in, within this um, space, still a, a northern, more continental people who had basically lost mm, control 
on at least their, their opportunities to venture further out. Naturally, there was plenty of of Gitish Vikings here and there, right? But what matters here is their own activity as a, as a single polity, right? As a tribal confederacy of some sort, right? So that the the Westerners wouldn't wouldn't count them as something essentially more than than the Swedes uh, as such, and this opens to the debate on how right the Keats were at some point uh, subsumed by the Swedes. Right, the fact that the the consolidation of Sweden brought the creation of a effectively of a Swedish kingdom that is the one probably of the, of the old uh, Swedes ruling over uh, the other uh, inhabitants of, of the regions um, and the likelihood being that uh, this union uh, would arrive mostly through a complicated but still somehow dynastic uh, personal individual process, right? Not really merging the Swedes with the Geats and uh, and the Gutes, rather, you know, acknowledging the preeminence at least of the uh, of the Swedish area, or which even some, as as it happened, right in the kingdom of Sweden, many Gittish kings w- would rule, right? But that were called, right? They they were still part of a broader, um, in fact, ancestry. It would at at that point be considered larger than the, merely than the Geats as such, uh, or not. Uh, and this process would have occurred largely undocumented uh, from the 6th to the 9th century, right? So that by the Viking era, we can't say yes, that the Swedes were already significantly more um, powerful and generally speaking, the Geats were put, were living a bit uh, on the outskirts and aside. But this doesn't mean that they were, first of all, one people, right? It was actually both things. They, they felt themselves separated, but as we will see, they're was already a broader, say, Swedish feeling, or at least a sense of broader political cohesion or cooperation was taking place very loosely at that time, because, again, it would take really a lot before probably a feudal kingdom would emerge, uh, even, say, essentially by the late Middle Ages, right? It it, it wouldn't happen before than that. Um, In any case, um, Sweden starts having, especially after the Viking era and the the affirmation of Christianity, and significant international uh, relations, from uh, the diplomas of which we can understand at least how the local rulers styled themselves. For example, there are some papal letters from the 80s of the 11th century, um, in which the recipients uh, in Sweden are titled as King of the Swedes or King of the West Geats, interestingly enough, so that the eastern Giddish lands were also kind of the least uh, important, as we will see. In fact, the main center would exist in the west, but even there, right, there was not really a full unity. There were even some separated political bodies operating pretty pretty late in time. Then there is, um, in the 60s of the 12th century, the first mention of the famous title Rex Sveorum et Gotorum, which is quite eloquent because it highlights naturally still what you know uh, the the Swedes considered themselves like at the time, like a sum of two peoples fundamentally, right? A monarchy that had brought together in a way or another these populations, the Swedes being the more important, but figuring basically uh, au pair with the Geats in this case. Here, at least the term is the Gauti in Latin, which doesn't uh, distinguish much even from the Gutes and so on, but um, considering that Gotland was at least a smaller entity, of course, the, the Geats were the second most important people in Sweden after the Swedes. Um, as you know, on, on the longer run, this double title would become customarily uh, for 
the Swedish kings, right? Uh, were kings of, of the Swedes, but also of the Geats. Um, and essentially from, constantly from the 70s of the 13th century. But you understand how long it took, right? This gives you a dimension. Aside from all the wars that were being fought among uh, the, the same, uh, the, these groups, of the kind of slowness of, of the process of political compaction. Uh, that often, as we have said, came also through dynastic struggle. For example, um, the Swedish house of Munzo uh, in the 11th century, uh, which w had been the earliest reliably attested royal dynasty of Sweden, uh, became excellent. Right? Actually, there are basically every single king of this house is uh, disputed in his uh say historicity or at least in his uh, in basically any information that we can know about him starting even from the chronology or whatever in any case with that of Emmond the Old that had been king of Sweden sometime around the, between the 50s and the 60s of the 11th century Stenkil uh, a Geet was elected as the king of the Swedes. And this tells you what we were talking about before. That is to say, you know, what these peoples cared about, like in the fully traditional way, was, you know, they considered themselves as free people, um, even though these dynasties were, say, in general clans were growing with some important degree of, of power over the, um, the rest of, of the population and so on. Um, and they would simply call one ruler, right? This is basically the entire history of most of ancient and medieval history, right? When you, when you see a, a guy coming from, in this case, like a Geet coming to rule in the Swedes, it doesn't mean that the Swedes were becoming Geetish for some reason. It was just a guy that they picked, maybe exactly because he, he was external to the Swedes. Uh, he was, in theory, would have been, in theory, super partis, or at least was not considered much of a threat, often. Right, this is like I don't know. There are examples of elective monarchies, like in Germany. Normally, the, the princes tried to elect somebody that was, say, yeah, powerful enough to get the job done, but also not too powerful to bother the sort of the private business of the princes that were acting as little kings in their own land without too much uh, concern at that point for for any other broader issue, if, um, unless uh, it, it would it, it was to damage them or they could profit from it in in the first place right surely the geats throughout all this phase of uh, swedish history were thus very influential right and they especially led the country um throughout uh christianization the affirmation properly of a christian monarch right this uh predictably in a country with the the political imbalances like Sweden would cause immediately some, and exactly because of the, essentially the weakness of the monarchy in itself, um, cause a period of civil unrest between the, let's say, the pro-Christians and the pro-pagans, let's say, that have not much to do with, with the ideology in itself, but rather with uh, kind of political practicalities that, yes, were reflected by the same. Right, but the future, of course, was Christianity for for many reasons. Uh, the Geats tended to be more Christian, and this is fascinating because normally it's the more advanced people that uh, get, you know, more quickly right the civilizational understanding of why, you know, it is important to to take that step that would help dramatically the the compaction uh, of the country, its power, influence, and so on. Um, in this case, it's a bit the reverse, right? And it tells you probably also how not so dramatically uh, different in power that these two peoples really were uh, within the country. Um, perhaps because the 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 Geats had been brought relatively under by the Swedes, they they, they paradoxically had a greater sense of the importance of kind of an institutional culture that could come through uh, the Christian monarchy, right? So the Swedes were a bit more pagan, you know, the, the center of Uppsala, uh, 
the general importance. Again, the, it, it's a very complicated story. I made that video about medieval Sweden partly addressing it, but we will come back on it more prepotently because it's um, uh, it's actually very complex and interesting. A uh, famous passage of this power struggle and uh, relative uh, wavering between Christianity and paganism was the deposition and expulsion of the Christian king, Inge the Elder, by his brother, Blot Svein, who was instead um, a pagan. Inge fled to Vester Gotland in exile, meaningfully enough. Right? So again, the, the Gitish support to Christianity is evident, even in this incident, right? Uh, this occurred famously in the 80s of the um, 11th century. Then Inga would retake the throne um, and rule, right, starting essentially Christian history for good in Sweden. The 12th century chronicler Saxo Grammaticus, in his Gesta Danorum, specifically in the 13th book, noted that the Geats had no say in the election of the Swedish king. Only the Swedes had. Like, this is also interesting. So by that point, some sort of balance had already been uh, established for which the Swedes had the upper hand within, uh, in fact, uh, southeastern Scandinavia. When the West Gittish law, um, so the, the one of Vester Gotland was written down for us also to um, to, to document it, it um, reminded explicitly that the Geats had to accept the monarch elected by the Swedes. As we've seen, the Swedes had, could, could even elect a Gittish, right? But the point is that it was the Swedes that had the, just the, uh, the privilege Right, the uh, prerogative of of doing of deciding in the first place. Right, they have not just that as you know in terms of election, but also the one of the position of the king. Right, not only this process occurred uh, through the uh, hostaging basically of some Gittish uh, people. Right, that. Uh, would bring to a, literally to a march through um, uh, the through, through, a, through a path known as Eric's Gata, right? The tour traditionally, in fact, taken in the Middle Ages by a newly elected Swedish king to the to the important provinces of the realm, right? As to show that he at least could even put together some forces and moving in the territories. Um, and uh, this territory naturally encompassed the, the Gittish provinces, also Nerke, Westmanland. Uh, here, the uh, newly elected king had to be, in a sense, be um, also evaluated in his lawfulness, right? By consulting the local, uh, you know, uh, juridical experts. Right, uh, and the respective councils locally. There is also an interesting um, episode which escalated in, in violence um, in uh, 1125 when the newly elected King Ragnvald Knapp Hövde rode together with his retinue in order to receive essentially the uh, the, the recognition of his rule, the lawfulness of his rule, and at least according to the oldest manuscript of the law of uh, West uh, Gotland, he despised the Geats so much that he decided to avoid even asking hostages. Um, you would think this was a, you know, just even. You know, they would have not had to give any hostage to the king, right? Because it was a way to, a primitive way to, to control the, this more peripheral areas, at least from, from a Swedish background. 
But this was actually a ferocious insult because it was basically even saying you don't count anything in all this. I don't even need to take hostages to rule over you. You're less. Uh, you're, surely the Swedes had the sense of superiority over the Geats that were also, generally speaking, less developed, etc. Uh, and Wu thought well to actually massacre Ragnvald uh, near Falköping. Right uh, in in Western Gotland. This is how things were were done at the time, right? So, um, in any case, uh, things flowed um, more or less um, towards a um, general compaction again of the Swedish kingdom. For example, in the fifties of the fourteenth century, there was a new general law. Um, uh, emanated by the uh, Swedish king Magnus the Fourth, Magnus Eriksson, stating that twelve men from each of the provinces uh, of of the kingdom had to be chosen by their local councils should be present at the Stone of Mora essentially in Knivsta, uh, when a new king was elected, naturally it was some sort of solemn um, ceremony, this place that had some spiritual um, identity value, uh, and so on. And this shows how, basically, the, say, from, from the time of, of, of hostages, things had changed into, like, at least show up, if you support me, as it was done normally, I don't know, think about during the, the, the aforementioned German diet and so on. It was a matter of saying, you know, if you if you come there, we can measure politically how many forces we have with us, how much they are willing to just to show up in a way that this this costs um, in some degree as well. Um, in some countries, this thing was also eventually eliminated because the um, uh, moving with the retinues up to one place was was a bit of a problem. It was also a way to probably ask more um, in terms of allegiance and sheer cost to the more peripheral areas, right? And naturally, these evidences were also chosen as uh, the place for gathering forces in the case of you know going to blast those who who were not showing up for whichever reason so the new the new campaign of the year um, uh, in, um, in in inside uh, the power of the Geats wasn't really waning throughout the Middle Ages right they remained this very actually increasingly important um, Swedish say national symbol by a degree right uh, they as in as much especially as the historiographical sense that they may have been connected with the gods arose naturally this is a controversial thing because as we will see aside from the general gaps in historiography the made up uh, you know, uh, say chronology of gothic kings that uh, the Romans made for the gods that needed that as monarchic powers during the migration era there was surely a nucleus of of people coming from southeastern Scandinavia at, at the root of at least the, the first conglomerations of what would become the larger gothic confederacies right the problem is understanding within this group that as we've seen also from Jordanus uh, Procopius etc was in theory a broader Gothic land, uh, etymologically speaking, Wu was Wu substantially. Naturally, the Swedes were called Swedes, so that were the Swedes, that they were in the Latin source, there was something else. So the Geats were at least the largest uh, group of people, as we've seen after the Swedes, in the country. There was also Gotland, but that, uh, as we've seen, didn't quite count in, in, in the same way. And and as you know, there is no really a way to determine whether the, to to know in the first place that the the history of the gods, right, uh, from the moment of 
the, the movement from Scandinavia, from where, if they did in the first place. There's no way to tell any of that, right? We just follow the fact that it was pretty plausible and then everything is lost in the midst of the history without any possibility of, of tagging anything at that point given that the document historiographical sources are the ones that they, that, that, that they really are um, in any case towards the later middle ages with the decline of tradition and universalism these weeds began to um, claim to boast the, the descendants from, from the gods Right. In other words, they equated the Geats to the gods, um, and there were some international occasions, such as the Council of Basel in 1434, when they started um, practically claiming that this, right, and arguing with the Spanish representatives um, at the uh, at the council regarding who was the true god, right, because the uh, the Swedes said, well, we are, you know, the descendants from those who uh, allegedly defeated the Roman Empire. Well, not quite, but um, in a, at least with all the, the glorious history of, of the gods in, in the migration here, the, the Spaniard says, but we are actually the descendants from, from at least the gods who moved from their homes and didn't remain there, sitting ducks, right? So we are actually the the descendants of the true heroes. And this thing went on, right, as goticism in these lands, not only, but mostly in Sweden, but also in Spain. Um, you know, uh, we will talk more about the Visigoths at some point, but I made, as you know, a video both for the um, gods and the, uh, say, the, the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths. Uh, and uh, this went on, like Sarmatism for the Poles. Again, it's something that they made up later because they had to stress a specific kind of role internationally. Surely there were broader implications domestically for this, but now we don't have the time to simply digress on it. Um, by the time of the Kalmar Unionen, so we are in the 15th century, um, the the Swedes, uh, say, in a broader sense of, of, of the country, of the kingdom of Sweden, uh, began to feel a bit like one people, one nation. So that the, the difference between the Swedes and, and the Geats was fundamentally um, just a, a sort of provincial one, right? Um, and this is also proven by the fact that probably the objective Svensk became a common ethnonym, right, for for the whole country, right? Naturally, differences, sense of belonging, identity, uh, even issues, for that matter, remained, right? But the, again, the work of the state, of the feudal monarchy, etc., brought to a substantial compaction of a sort of Swedish national identity. However, it is true that since the 9th century we do find the uh, the term Sver um, as um, still a sort of, at least in a minority way, but referring to the entirety of at least what we could call Sweden today, so including the Swedish tribe and the one of the Geats as well, right? So definitely, again, in the in Scandinavia, the existence of let's say, when, when do you trace back the the first glimpse of a sort of broader national say identity that matches up the one of the contemporary one? Right? It's obvious you can't draw it for every single country to, you know, the, the literal beginning of history, in a way or in another, right? The problem is measuring it accurately um, for the time right uh, in Adam of Bremen we find for example the Geats um, called gods as both um, a proper nation and part of the Sueones so again that already kind of subordination to the Swedes um, uh, so in general, right, uh, the the it's like again for every country's region, province, etc. There, there is a sort of 
this kind of identity remaining all over time um, still still today mostly the idea is that the Swedes use the Geats as saying ah, this is, look we have the gods here they're the same guys of the migration era right so we are the cool ones right so this began to emerge in other ways uh, during the say the, the, the reformation say against the, the Catholics uh, the Catholic Romans we say ah, oh, we are the Swedish gods there were this kind of things right you know um, uh, surely some even connection with with Arianism at that point, or at least with um, some sort of um, uh, dif- difference from wh- whatever um, the papacy would, would say. In any case, um, the Geats, uh, as we've seen, seem to have been a pretty standardly or organized people uh, throughout all this, this time. As a, you know, any again provincial entity that remained there with a political identity, autonomy, uh, uh, organization, etc. They had their own things, that is, the the, pub, the freemen assemblies, they had their own laws that were decided um, locally as customs. The greatest thing was in Westergotland, um, in, known as the thing of all geats, uh, held every year in the proximity of Skara. However, as we were saying before, Östergötland had its own assembly in Lyonga. Uh, the, the inhabitants of Västergötland and Dalsland would mostly participate to the first one, even though it was, as we've seen, meant for, for every, all the Geats, while the Lyonga one was for the uh, Eastern Geats. The Geats had also a different administrative uh, system than the Swedes, right? The, the latter used the Undere, which we, we don't know, it's like, just like the hundreds in England, whether it was about the number of acres or the number of freemen, so of um, essentially of armed uh, men uh, settled in uh, as a district, right? Uh, the uh, former use instead the herrat, right? Also in modern Swedish you have herrat, right? Uh, just like the Norwegians and the Danes, uh, which is fascinating because it shows a, a provincial variety that is also similar to uh, the, the Western S- Scandinavians. And it, it's remarkable even more that it would be the Geetish term that would prevail for the uh, the, the administrative uh, districts of the Swedish kingdom as a whole, right? The reason being that since uh, many Swedish kings had been Geetish uh, um, in extraction, background ancestry, is that you know this term, this practice, or for whichever reason, right, this district system worked better. We don't have to think it was radically different from from the bottom of the Swedes, but in general, right, even just as a term, closed lands could have been simply uh, adopted. Um, the, uh, the This was the basic districtuation, by the way, especially in Vestergötland and Dalsland that were more advanced than uh, Östergötland, there would be uh, a higher um, uh, fact province right, uh, made up of the various herred known as Bo, which usually was linked to a Kongsgurt, so a say a larger estate, uh, often fortified, for instance, a castle essentially. Uh, lording over um, the most powerful uh, aristocracy, right? And consider that the whole country was basically about this kind of rural profile, so with some kind of more consistent towns, but you know, m- most of the settlements would be villages or at best groups of villages, asking even from political recognition by from the monarchy to essentially bully other um, other villages uh, around. Um, so, uh, consider 
in general that the the title of King of the Gods and King of the Vents was uh, an official one uh, for quite a long time, right? The Vents referring to the kind of the influence that the Swedes had even on, on the Slavs on the uh, you know across, across the Baltic on the northern uh, or the southern shores of of the Baltic. Uh, today, the Swedish monarchy simply holds the title kings of Sweden, fundamentally. Uh, but the uh, memory of the of the gods, properly, uh, is something pertaining really to a bit the the identity of, of the Swedish. If anything, the Swedish monarchy and naturally the the national identity as the sum of, of these peoples in this even kind of broader colonial attitudes, this, you know, with the Scandinavian expansion in the Baltic, the participation to the to the Crusades uh, in the region, uh, etc. Right now, about the connection between the Geats and the Gods, um, as we've seen, the etymology is is definitely the same. Right, uh, there is a connection there. Um, it would be more interesting to describe, say, in the sense what we mean by God, especially later on. Right, and for what the, um, if anything, the late antique um, ethnographers uh, cared about, because um, evidently this concept of, of of gods wouldn't stick to any, like to, to the entirety of um, of Sweden on the longer run, uh, and we do not have really any source from the time telling us what kind of, you know, how would an average person living in, I don't know, in fact, in uh, Öster Götland would feel about being a god and why would the, the name mean, uh, etc. Uh, what, however, is important is the connection and especially the realization that there isn't really a affiliation from the Geats or the Gutes uh, to the gods, but rather from the fact that Again, the the gods, the gods are were this broader group that um, Jordanus tells you know he came originally to Dacia from the island of Skansa and so on. That the Geats were gods and not vice versa, because in fact of, of the same information we get right these three tribes in the area were the Gauti gods, as we've seen the Ostro gods, then the Va gods that. We we don't even know exactly whether they were meant like the Gutes as the inhabitants of Götaland, according to uh, to Jordanus. Um, but in any case, the, this Gothicness was much larger than the Geats themselves, right? That were just one of of these gods broadly meant, and for again whatever it meant, that uh, unfortunately is not entirely clear uh, in the picture. Um, as you know, the the, the Terbingi, the Grotungi, etc., but just later, just they were called like that, and they they would later just be named by the Romans as gods, as we were saying before. You know that essentially the gods were the the people for which the Romans created properly um, uh, a mythology, right? A, a myth of kings, by the way, because they were already you know, quite, uh, you know, essentially, they had been de facto Roman creations themselves, monarchically speaking, and these peoples originally weren't quite um, familiar with the concept of monarchy, it was actually somehow alien to their to their uh, balance socially. But the term by then was a synecdoche of some sort, right? Uh, also the later division of, in gods, because the the actual gods were, th this thing was carried out in Italy, right? The town of Cassiodorus, Theodoric, and so on. So that the gods were the Italian ones, and consequently the West, the ones in Spain, were called Visigoths because they were West at that point. Um, and then, just as a reflection later on, as there were the the, the West gods, were the Ostrogoths. Speaking of the Italian ones, but um, the 
the again th this terms had been somehow um, you know used uh, in a in a completely different context now from what the ones from which the same gothic term had originated so again I, I will make more about gothic history because it, it's really important in general and these were definitely the the most um, impacting uh, Germanic um, confederacies of the uh, of the migration here uh, but also the ones that again were most Romanized right and therefore assuming certain characteristics that um, do not help us entirely understanding but w what is myth what is history and what is in that sense more like a classical ethnographic made up than you know the actual story of these people uh, however if we look at uh, archaeology we can be fairly sure that if even if we can't see a literal explicit connection saying these were gods he passing through here etc there are some scandinavian burial burial customs for example uh, the stone circles uh, of the iron age uh, that are very similar uh, to the um, ones we find in northern Poland in the first century AD. There is plenty of that in Gothland as well, in, in Gotland. Um, the, the, there is the Bauta, Stenar, Stelai type. So, in the, especially in the Gothic Bilbark culture, right, this uh, East Pomeranian Mazovian one, between the, the first and fifth century AD with which we, we associate the gods and their movement uh, later on uh, down the, the, the Vistula and then the the, Nasser, the you know arriving up to the Black Sea we can't think of course that throughout this time uh, there were the say among the gods that Jordanus describes that had naturally in part remained in Scandinavia the, the the same in fact ancestors of these peoples um, in fact as we were hinting at before especially in Östergötland so actually the most developed area likely also at the time uh, compared to, to the eastern part and that therefore was more prone to exceedances uh, likely right at least more systemic uh, change we find a disappearance of villages around the same time right so the idea is that um, we can track that movement approximately from from Scandinavia, and so it is basically fair to call the Geats the gods, except uh, uh, it, it's not really in the sense that those were the the ancestors of the gods as a whole, right? They may have come from other places, of course, of Scandinavia, and um, Generally speaking, this uh, say the ones that matter in that sense. The Spaniards were right; we were the ones who had been moving from uh, from Scandinavia. In any case, the the, con the connection with the North was always present. If you read just the history of some peoples, also that we we're talking about the other day with Great Moravia, the heroly that crossed back north uh, to the Jutland after were crushed by the Longbirds. This was this kind of a in part presumably accepted in, in, in another sense um, truly uh, existent uh, ancestral origin from Scandinavia at least for most of the Traditionskern and part of the actual uh, ethnic nucleus of these peoples coming from Scandinavia and in great part uh, especially for the Eastern Germans from these Gothlands if we can call them like this as far as the Gethai of Dacia, that, as you know, are also a name, an, an older people of the uh, of the Iron Age, uh, we do not instead find any kind of gothic connection. Later on, yes, the, the gods that are being moved in the Carpathian Basin, essentially, and, and also south, so overlapping with the uh, gothic uh, lands uh, after the Roman conquest and departure from the region uh, 
Uh, there was surely an adaptation also of the, the Conquerors to the local customs, even clothing. I made a video about the, uh, the, the Gothic archers that took that in, in consideration. Um, but the two people seemingly do not have much to do with one another. Left aside that, however, any movement of people in some groups, war bands, whatever was possible. So it's it's absolutely fair to stress, surely. You know, any people of the Celts of the Germany, even of the even of of the the Dorians or I don't know the Italics, surely had some kind of common ancestry with somebody that say had joined maybe at the time, or that were all already in the proto in the European culture at the beginning, and that had already separate beginning to separate. But this is irrelevant. We just know that. It is the case, and there is nothing to be surprised of. Um, now, there are some other uh, fringe theories regarding mostly the, mm, say, the, the location of certain, at least, places of origins of uh, various um, historical or mythical people. Um, there is, for example, uh, the, the Gotland theory that once. You know some important historical events that traditionally took place in uh, Malayan, uh, the uh, the Lake Malar in English uh, near Stockholm, as especially the, the location of such events is said in uh, Gotland. Uh, then there are other uh, interesting considerations telling the truth about the identification of the. Um, from from the old English Yats or Yathas, uh, the old Norse Gautar, right, and modern Swedish Gautar that would um, essentially speak of the Geats as um, the, uh, the 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 protagonist of the not just of Beowulf but of uh, the for example the 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 saga of Bödvar, the Arkida the warlike little bear, right? Because the, the mechanism there is always the same thing, that uh, this hero arrives uh, on a boat from somewhere east, and uh, this would be, in fact, uh, in, in some sources, Gautland, but properly would be the land of the Geats as such. Uh, it overlaps, it repeats itself, and arrives at the Danish court and kills the local terrible beast, Grendel, or, or whatever. Um, and so, rather than coming from, you know, from in these various um, traditions from other proposed places, this would stick basically to the Geats specifically. There is also another branch that looks at the, pos the, the possibility of essentially a, um, a Geatish origin for the youth as such in, uh, in the youth land. Um, and this uh, would speak of literally either of affiliation or a again the fact that they were essentially in, uh, a group that had split at some point um, and connecting this also st still with Beowulf, given that he would have um, he, he lived there. Um, so this is based all on some philological. Um, say issues that I don't know how, how useful it is now to, to digress on, but it has been somehow debunked because uh, looking at uh, different sources, right, uh, from the Vidsit, um, be it the Venerable's uh, ecclesiastical history from which we get information about these people mixed also with, with, with the Norse epos and so on, especially in the early times, uh, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, etc., we get properly a distinct name of the youths from a different uh, root, right? Because you see, Yetas, youths, um, at least there is a similarity with the Old English, but seemingly the, the etymology is different as much as the name of the people as such, right? Uh, Youthland, uh, uh, the youths would have another etymology having to do with water, right? More marshy areas um, or at least more uh, close properly to the sea, as we've seen the, uh, the Geats at least being cut out in a relatively early time from from a, 
say, dramatic uh, maritime uh, power. Finally, there is the Gutnish or Gutish, or whatever you want to call it, hypothesis, according to which uh, Beowulf would have not been a, a Geet, but a Gut. Uh, so, uh, coming from the island of Gotland, and uh, there is all, uh, you know, th th there were some, again, fringe theories, but most, more than not recognized, but at least that remain minority from, you know, promoted by prominent uh, archaeologists um, and historians that would essentially identify all the series of places from the from the epos in uh, in the island of, of Gotland, right? And uh, the 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 sense is, however, that there is such a great proximity between these various uh, Swedish provincial uh, say provinces that there is no way to exclude properly any uh, of course even derivation from one another in some, uh, as groups because again we do not know exactly how they would you know, just feel themselves like wh which whichever group was founded or you know by um, ex novo for example by through a new domination through again a uh, uh, a geet maybe in Gotland, vice versa. Again, all this revolves around some phenological subtleties, such as I don't know one source claiming that the uh, the 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 the, the geets as the essentially the the sea um, geets and the water the the weather geets etc. Uh, would have lived east of the Danes called the Dacians in here to and be separated from the Swedes by wide waters right and you look at Gotland and say well maybe that's that's the thing in any case again this pertains to mostly again uh, unprovable facts as most of this history unfortunately is lost um, in the absence of more uh, specific documentary sources that at this point, there is no way to to, to hope, at least, to, to to find significantly um, in some you know hidden uh, manuscript somewhere, etc. At least, in order to to build uh, a new historiographical current on it, uh, etc. Uh, in any case, this is just the profile of the Geats, and we will talk about them shortly at some other point have to talk about the Swedes, we have to talk about even just uh, the other peoples, the Danes, the Utes, um, uh, and and more. Still haven't made a video about medieval Iceland, for example, nor about Finland, as a matter of fact. Uh, in any case, we will cover all this stuff, hopefully, with time. For today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this Video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.